Okay, well, thank you all for coming out to this House of Books tonight. We are really excited about this panel that we have, and thank you all for wearing masks as well. We have some immune compromised people in the audience, so that's very helpful. Uh, so tonight we're going to be talking about crime uh, and where those fit in the, the broader scheme of things. I admit the comments three years ago, if you had asked me, I would have kind of pursued them and said, I don't know what the big deal is, why do people like this so much? Uh, and then someone introduced me to some non-fiction type comments, and that really started to change my mind about what this forum can do. So tonight we have Robert K. Elder, who is a former Billings resident, and some of you apparently know him. Uh, <laughs> uh, he has a relatively new book called Hemingway in Comics. So he will be talking about how this larger-than-life character has been used uh, in comics in a broad array of ways. We have Dr. Jennifer Lynn from MSUB. She teaches in the History Department. And she uses comics and graphic novels regularly, both in her research and in her classroom. So she'll be giving us a little bit of insight into, into that. And then we have Kevin Kuistra, who is, the, as I'm sure a lot of you know, the director at the Western Heritage Center. And if you don't know, we have Ethel Hayes, a uh, pioneering female cartoonist in the 1920s, uh, who was a Billings resident. And so that's part of the reason we have a local historian here to talk to us. With that, I will turn it over to the illustrious panel to give themselves a possibly deeper and better introduction than I just gave, and then we'll jump into some questions. Are we going to start? Sure. Uh, one of the questions was, how did we get to this point that we know a person or... Uh, and so for me, Ethel Hayes was somebody I actually had seen several times because of uh, things like the uh, Coyote, which is the Billings Annual. She illustrated several of them from 1909, 1910, 11, 1911. So I had seen her work. And then during the 1937 flood here in Billings, she illustrated a page of the Billings Gazette. And I never really put it together. I just saw Ethel Hayes, Ethel Hayes again. Uh, and, then, uh, and then eventually I just discovered, actually through a children's book, Townhouse, Town Mouse. I was like, Ethel Hayes, that's the same person. And then I started kind of working my way back and learning her story. So, um, you know, she's on the, uh, she's in the down, oh, there you go. Thank you, very nice. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't realize the impact of her at all until we started doing research. And a lot of the research that I'm basing my, my work today is from Lauren Hundley. Lauren spent a, a long time putting together the research. She's actually on vacation in West Virginia right now. So, uh, but uh, that's how I got to know her story. And then, like I said, her impact during the 1920s in particular in terms of shaping like women's fashion and uh, presenting a different woman, uh, at least in uh, cartoons that had been presented earlier. Um, you know, you used to see women cartoonists doing like the Cupid doll stuff and uh, very feminine portrayal of women. And all of a sudden in the flapper era, you have this woman who's from the Billings High School class of 1912 presenting kind of this imagery of a woman with shorter hair and wearing pants and kind of being very progressive and outgoing and uh, and one of the most popular cartoonists of the 1920s. Uh, I saw somewhere that you could look at like the uh, Zigfield Follies as a theater element of how women were portrayed in the 20s. F. Scott Fitzgerald maybe in writing and Ethel Hayes in cartooning. Those three really kind of start defining the shape of what the flapper era looks like, so. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want me to add? <laughs> no, I just like the pants part, you know. Oh, it's yeah. very risque for oh, yeah, the women to be wearing yeah. pants. Um, my students actually, um, in a course, we looked at cartoonists of the 1920s, and we looked at Ethel Hayes, and they were very excited to learn. In fact, Ellen was in this class, and we, we looked at Ethel Hayes' kind of cartoons and her context, so um, she's becoming more... I think famous yeah. among I think people so. too. So, um, so I I teach uh, modern European history courses um, at MSU Billings, and I developed a course uh, called uh, World History Since 1945 Through Graphic Novels. 
and I was really interested in graphic novels as a primary source. So choosing graphic novels that were written by individuals who experienced a particular event. Um, so that, that really gave the students kind of an entry point into a particular moment in history. Um, and this semester, which began only like a week and a half ago, um, uh, I had a student email me. Um, he had got his books for a class and he said, you know, Dr. Lin, I think I've made a mistake because I bought my books and I opened one of them and it's only pictures. It's like a comic. Uh, what should I do? And I was like, I assured him this indeed is the correct book for the class, uh, which I think he was excited about and surprised. But I think that's just really telling that students don't particularly expect getting history out of a graphic novel. Um, I think that it's an entry point that can be unusual, which leads to then kind of larger historical questions. Um, the graphic novels I would say I choose, I was mentioning, uh, can be a little bleak. <laughs> Sometimes a little bleak. Um, I, I use, for example, um, Safe Area Garajta, which I saw was, I think, over there about the war in Bosnia. And I think what's really cool about graphic novels for students is they have the text which provides like the complex historical narrative. You know, so here's the narrative about the collapse of Yugoslavia, the rise of Serbian nationalism, how it happened. But then they get the images to get the emotive response. Um, and of course, many of these images drawn by a journalist who's there at the time, they are images that represent violence among the community, um, you know, hospital procedures without anesthesia, trekking through the wilderness to drop zones to pick up supplies. And they're able to, I think, in a better way, understand things like the impact of trauma and violence in historical perspective. Um, so I, I get really excited, and I think the students respond in a very different way to a graphic novel than they might a different text. And then perhaps that piques their curiosity to learn more about a particular subject or a particular area. So, um, yeah, that's kind of my, my spiel for now. I'll let, I'll let you talk more no, about No, 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 that, that's great. That's great. Because I'm, I'm all the way on the other end. I mm -hmm. am, uh, like, postmodern, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because uh, Hemingway in comics uh, is about what happens when you lose control of your iconic status, when you become so much a part of pop culture that you know, you start showing up in Superman comic books. Like, quite literally, Ernest Hemingway shows up in Superman. He's a sidekick in a Wolverine uh, comic. He shows up in Mickey Mouse comics in Italy. And so it's sort of about that prism of when you become so famous, which aspects of you survive beyond your work. Uh, and that was has been a lot of fun. Um, and uh, uh, I just came back uh, from uh, Ketchum, Idaho, where I was the artist in residence. I got to stay in Hemingway's house, which was pretty awesome. And we had an art exhibit. Um, and uh, uh, I, I will tell people publicly, so Kevin here does not know me from Adam. Like, we met for the first time just a few minutes ago, but he spent a generous hour on the phone with me when I called. And I was telling him, hey, I have this art exhibit. What do I do? Um, you know, I, I, I've had a couple of people reach out, but, like, how do I sort of get it on the road? Um, and his kindness literally um, means that next year, so uh, if you want to go to Ketchum, Idaho, you can see the exhibit. It's up until November. Then it goes to the San Diego Comic-Con in July. And after that, it's going to be on the road for five to seven years, thanks to Kevin. Um, and so I'm really saying this is all Kevin's fault. Really, this is, this is what I'm saying. I am smiling right now. Yeah, yeah, yes. uh, but, but again, so I, 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 you know, I live in Chicago. I live outside of Chicago. I come home. But I am always struck by just like the kindness and generosity of people here. So, so again, publicly, thank you to Kevin. Oh, yeah. Thank you. There was no question there at all. I just wanted to go about how great Kevin was. <laughs> so. Uh, well, great. Thank you, everyone, for the better introductions than I gave you. Um, so one of the things, and Jen touched on it, but I think, Robert, with what you were talking about with Hemingway, so Hemingway is a historical and literary figure, and you're talking about he's used in all these surprising ways. And is there 
I, can we bring this back in some way to what Jen was talking about so you get this emotive response with graphic novels that is perhaps their strength, mm -hmm. particularly in comparison with straight prose? Well, H Hemingway is a little gonzo in this <laughs> example because comic book artists choose him because he lived in the most interesting places during the most chaotic times. Mm -hmm. And he becomes sort of a zealot figure, you know. Right. He was, uh, you know, a, a volunteer for the American Red Cross in World War One. He covered the Spanish uh, mm -hmm. Civil War. He covered World War Two. He had four wives, and won the Pulitzer and the Nobel. So there's enough of him in enough different places that he's just an interesting character to be able able to plug in. And everybody has their own Hemingway. So as Jennifer was talking about, sometimes it's an entry point into history right. uh, and sometimes again that takes on all sorts of different sort of cascade effects mm -hmm. yeah. well, I, I, you know Ethel Hayes of course you know she's portraying women in all of these different ways I think I have a list here that's really good women having drinks women smoking mm -hmm. women wearing makeup <laughs> women wearing pants women wearing shorts they're all little boxy cartoons mm -hmm. little one piece piece Women as athletic, equal or to or better than the boys, fashionable, <laughs> sassy, self-confident, independent, self-sufficient, professional, driven. It goes on and on. So you're getting all of these little pops. You know what I mean? I, I, oddly enough, I think of Gary Larson, who does the Far Side. Mm -hmm. You know, I, it comes up in my you know day to day all the time. Somebody will have like a pet Komodo dragon. I'll be like, oh well, you can raise him as a baby. They make great pets, and I always think of that one little cartoon that he has a giant squid in the living room. <laughs> you, know, so you, you get these little punches of images that then you carry with you, and it mm -hmm. seems to me if she's doing single panel stuff, mm -hmm. that's doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you're seeing somebody all of a sudden they're reflecting back at you, mm -hmm. and it and it does stay with you. You know, more than a sometimes a full length book will say, mm -hmm. you need to be a self confident woman where as all these panels that she did during the 20s really portrayed mm -hmm. this myriad of what women could be mm -hmm. at the time. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that kind of what you mentioned in terms of, you know, Hemingway's and all of these points of history that are particularly dramatic, um, and Ethel Hayes is representing the flapper of the 1920s. I think what's interesting, at least from my perspective with students, is they have that image and then they get the big context. So that Ethel Hayes, like you pointed out, it's about this kind of slapper, sassy woman from the 1920s, but then it's also contextualized, you know, in the larger context of what were women doing in the 1920s, you know, liberation from World War II, all kinds of political changes, getting the right to vote, asking for bodily autonomy, and so she represents the cartoon, but then also represents the larger historical idea, and, and I think that's what I think is so kind of interesting and magical about graphic novels is that students can walk away with both of those things and um, and I think it sticks with them you know that's what they write on the exams you know what they remember from the graphic novel right. is the image that they saw and and then that that gives them kind of a framework for for larger questions mm -hmm. do you hear from students in when you're reading your course evaluations do the graphic novels come up as a touch point? Yes, yes. They love the graphic novels. Um, I think at first they can be really challenging if students aren't used to reading a graphic a graphic novel, um, especially one that might not be in like very strict panel form. They don't know where to look on the page. Um, safe area garage that can, can be sometimes, of course I won't be able to find a page, but sometimes <laughs> chaotic. But then they get the sense of, oh, it's chaotic because Jose goes trying to represent a particular like moment of conflict, right, in, in Garajda. So I think it can be challenging to them, but once they get in it, they're hooked. You know, they really enjoy it. Do you, do you want to know a weird personal tie, tie to that book? Yeah. The first yeah. time it was published in the New York Times, I did a profile of Joe. The world is small. It is a super small place. I was like, oh, that's a new edition. I haven't seen that. The world is small. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so following on from that, I think it's, as I said, I wasn't really a comic graphic novel person until a few years ago, and so I've had this exact issue where I pick it up and go, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to do here. You know, if it's just prose in the, our, in 
the United States of America, we read from left to right and mm -hmm. top to bottom, and you turn the page this way, and, and manga is this thing where it goes the other way, and <laughs> graphic novels, mm -hmm. and there's an image, mm -hmm. and there's text, and am I supposed to look at the image first, or and where mm -hmm. is the text, and how does it, it's a little, mm -hmm. it can be daunting. Yeah. So yeah. It, it's, if you're talking to someone who is a relative newbie or someone who says, I'm not, I'm a little daunted by graphic novels, where would you recommend that they start? Mouse. Oh, that's what I was yeah, saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's Art Spiegelman, uh, you know, it's M-A-U-S. Um, by the way, let's mention so many books that Julie has to get them every single time we mention them. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But uh, MAUS, uh, it, it's actually in two parts, and it's about Art Spiegelman and his family's uh, escape from Nazi Germany. But I actually have such an affection for Mouse 2 because it's an autobiography of what it's like to be famous for this awful story. Um, and it's, again, super meta. Um, we and, called it. And, mm. and, and I'm not sure it's the best place to start. It's, not, it's, so it's, so, it's, it's very heavy. Okay, Rob, where, where would you start? Oh, um, somewhere else. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was thinking, like, wh so, so where do you start? Like, The Watchmen is, is very heavy, but it's nine panels, so it's yeah. easy mm -hmm. to digest. Well, where should we start? Well, I, I actually have questions for you, because <laughs> I, I wondered, like, with some of these people who write the graphic novels, like for your students, are they then, do students say, oh, I learned about this, you know, the Bosnia, mm -hmm. and then they quote and they cite this person as their source. That's what they do, right? Yeah. So it's like the writers of these are given that kind of credibility. I, I assume also they have a background. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So J Joe is a journalist. So. Okay. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and... And um, when I teach the graphic novels too, it's a contextualized too into larger, you know, what's this person's particular standpoint and role in portraying a conflict or an event. So, mm, yeah. yeah. Um, I really like Persepolis. Um, my students respond really well to that. Um, they do get a background on the Iranian Revolution, um, some bigger context, but they find the story of Marjane Satrapi, who experienced the Iranian Revolution as a child and left and came back incredibly compelling and there's these great scenes of like adolescence and youth that the students totally get um, and I think this is a great introductory into into kind of the graphic novel. I also love Maus. Um, I'm a German historian and so we have lots of conversations about representations of the past in the Holocaust and that elicited a huge response from the scholarly community and um, I teach it in an upper division course, and I also find it incredibly moving. But also, like you said, it's meta. Yeah, it's so it's meta. really complex to teach students and to have them digest the levels of his interviews with his father, his father's story, second generation Holocaust trauma, and the relationship he has with his mother who died. There's a lot going on. And all of the animal, all of the people are drawn as animals, and so, of course, the Jewish community is drawn as, as mice, the Nazis are drawn as cats, the Americans are dogs, the French <laughs> are frogs, frogs. <laughs> I think the Poles are pigs, yeah. um, but he's commenting of course on stereotypes, but it's, it's good, but there's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm just trying to think, like, what for, well, for somebody who wants to enter, and not at this heavy level, I'm just like, all right, I think all my favorite stuff is heavy. Yeah. So, uh, like, yeah. Uh, the sand. Oh, actually, Saga is great. Brian K. Vaughn, uh, Why the Last Man, which is being made into an FX series. I think it's the first mm -hmm. three episodes are out. It's great. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Mr. Promethea. That's mm -hmm. very, that's, that's, that's a meta Wonder Woman, mm -hmm. though. Like, so that's, that's even tougher. So, yeah. I, I'm going to throw in my recommendation, which, as you can tell, is slightly more bite size than some of the other things that people are recommending. So, so there, these are the Flintstone um, graphic novels, and it's it's the Flintstone characters that we're all familiar with, but uh, it's talking about a lot of social commentary type issues, so the role of women and um, consumerism and inequality, and so it touches on all of those things. And it for someone who's new to graphic novels, 
like it reads from left to right and top to bottom, mm. so it makes it so it's skinny and reads the way you expect it, but also gets you thinking about how the graphic novel form can uh, rival the prose form in terms of making you think about things. It was amazing for me that third graphic novel, which is all about the Armenian genocide in Flintstones. It's great. It really, it's, it's not. It's not. It's not. A couple of you, like I saw eyes that you're just like, okay. Yeah, historians have the same problem. We uh, we find out some incident that happened in Billings that was terribly racist and stuff, and we're like, oh my god, this is incredible. This is great. And you're like, oh, this is awful. Yeah. You know, like you have that evidence. Mm-hmm. Of something, but it can it means no, something. I, I just I, I was just talking to um, uh, Billy Parrott about this actually. Um, so there's a there's a talking about awful and amazing things that come from Billings. This is an awful one. Um, Clark Martill, who is a white nationalist, is from Billings, but exported it to Chicago and mm-hmm. founded the Chicago Skinheads. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So let's all forget he's from. Yeah. 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 But anyway, resonances, history, and recognizing it is important. Yeah. Yeah. Julie, I've derailed this. I'm sorry. <laughs> can, I, can I ask everybody here a question? Individually. Who here, yeah, individually, each person, <laughs> who here has read graphic novels? So there's some people that haven't, so maybe I can ask, ask my next question, because mm-hmm. I really don't know anything about them. Mm-hmm. Graphic novel sounds like. Mm-hmm. A novel that's graphic. Oh, I have a story about okay. this. When, right. when I was in college, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no. Actually, but when I was in college, um, I had a, a, a fellow student. We were working on projects for some class, and he said, "Oh, I'm doing my project on graphic novels," and I thought he meant like pornographic novels. <laughs> and I was like, "Wow, that's very interesting." And then he explained, "Oh, no, no, it's." It's a graphic novel, which there's a very long history of graphic it novels. Is. Yeah, and so, so since so. 1978, it was a, a term coined by Will Eisner, who wrote The Spirit, and the, gra- mm-hmm. uh, the, the first graphic novel is considered Contract with God, which is about people who live in tenements and it's multi generational. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it also became sort of a term of art around 1986 because you had paperbacks of The Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns from Frank Miller, and they started to go into bookstores. And so you know, graphic novel really does mean a novel that's a complete form, but it also means a collection of, you know, an arc of a mm-hmm. story. Mm-hmm. So um, there's a lot. There's a lot yeah. out there. So there, much. Yeah. I mean, Hogarth was doing like graphic series in like the 18th century, and Scott McCloud points to the Bayou Tapestry as like one of the first graphic telling. And then, of course, with printing and the reproduction of images much quicker, then that's shared with the wider press. And Topfer is like the, the, you know, the father of comics, but they didn't call it comics at the time. It was just serial images and story. Um, and then in the 1920s, um, there was this great group of German artists who created like an art deco expressionist graphic novels, but without text or very little text. So kind of these images related to social commentary of the 1920s. Um, and Lind Ward, I'll put a plug in for Lind Ward, this German artist who's amazing, who created an Art Deco version of Frankenstein in 1934, which is really beautiful if, you, if you're interested in monsters and Frankenstein. So yeah, a long history of this medium right, being a, a vehicle for storytelling, but also social criticism and historical memory. And as we say, how many people do you know are, I, I think the fellow Bronx here know, but the Billing Senior High um, icon logo w- was made from a, a comic strip artist, Stan Lynn. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I used to work right around the corner here at a place called Wizards Workshop when I was in junior high and high school, and Stan would do a signing there. But um, I, I came across his autobiography recently. And somebody really famous did the introduction, like hmm. John Wayne or Clint Eastwood. <laughs> uh, but Rick, Rick O'Shea was the name of the uh, comic that ran forever. And I think he was a Billings native. Yeah, it was Dan. Yeah, 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 it's yeah. 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 So, so, so Ken, like, mm-hmm. that's going to be a future, uh, a future installation at the mm-hmm. Western Air. Uh, we actually had him as a speaker a couple times. Oh, yeah. 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 Before he passed away. Yeah. I, I, yeah, I, I love his stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so you were talking, Jen, you were touching on how comic, the comic form has 
changed and transitions over the years. And I think one thing that is a, a hot topic recently is diversity and diverse voices mm -hmm. in, in literature and film and in the arts generally. Mm -hmm. And so how have, do you have any insights on how mm -hmm. that's moved? I mean, we've seen really popular uh, comics or graphic novels such as March. So John mm -hmm. Lewis famously chose the graphic novel form for his biography. Uh, and George Takei did also mm -hmm. with They Called Us Enemy. So we've, we've seen some diverse voices starting to tell their own stories, specifically choosing graphic novels to do it. Do you think this is mm -hmm. a trend or these? I hope so. I mean, that's what I would say. I think that the graphic novel lends itself really well to different kinds of perspectives and um, I'm not an American historian, so I'm sure there's lots and lots of American examples, but just thinking of the graphic novels that I use for my courses, they're all written by non, in general, in general, by non-white people and mostly women of color um, who, who use that as a, as a narrative. And I think graphic novels and comics, you know, have always been subversive. And so I think of like Alison Bechtel's, you know, she originally started out with a comic strip dykes to watch out for mm -hmm. and, and became a real icon, right, for the LGBTQ plus community because of that. So I think that there is this, this space among graphic novels and comics to really diversify the historical narrative, considering that they're not just kind of a triumphalist narrative of a particular right. worldview or past. They challenge that. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they have always been alternative. And people mm -hmm. forget, like, you know, uh, in the 1920s and teens, like uh, Ignatz and Crazy Cats, Crazy mm -hmm. Cat, that's an African-American creator. People just don't realize that. Uh, so I think there's much more history, there's much more opportunity, and the diversity of voices is a really interesting thing to observe. I could just mention with, with Ethel Hayes, what was interesting is that through the process uh, of her learning and her becoming a, uh, um, a cartoonist during the 1920s, she was taking an imagery, like I said, of the Cupid dolls and the, the woman in the uh, uh, form-fitting dress kind of stuff, and and so you know, almost being subversive mm -hmm. during the 1920s, mm -hmm. without really intending it. I think in some ways. I mean, all she did was that fringe kind of a character in the flapper era, and she, you know, as uh, Lauren would say, uh, brought it into the midwife, you know, midwestern housewife's <laughs> home. You know, to the point that they started looking at it and saying, "Ah, oh, you know, it's interesting." And then you see those images over a period of time. But even if that held true to the 20s, by the 1930s, Ethel Hayes is getting out of cartooning because there's a pushback. You know what I mean? So there's these trends, general trends, where you know some of these people are poking holes, and then all of a sudden the 30s and 40s rolls around, and there's a pushback. Uh, maybe you know uh, going back to these older portrayals. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there's a like a rhythm. I would think that there's like in the 1950s. I know there was a big pushback against cartoonists or or even like violence portrayed in like comic books mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah, it, it, mm -hmm. it shut down a whole publishers. Mm -hmm. Seduction of the Innocent. Dr. Frederick Wortham mm -hmm. had a whole crusade. It shut down a lot of horror and uh, like police sort of mm -hmm. comics. Uh, and that's why we had the Comics Code Authority. Um, which uh, Mad Magazine became a magazine, so it wasn't a comic book to get around the Comics mm -hmm. Code Authority. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Are there are there pushbacks on the graphic mm -hmm. novels? Uh, no. Not that I know of any graphic yeah. novels. Yeah. But no, there, there, there's yeah. always a little bit of w the more subversive, mm -hmm. the more heat you get. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there's a great documentary about Mike Diana. I forget where it is now. If it's on Netflix or Amazon, but. Yeah, uh, what's it called? Boiled Angels. Boiled Angels, which is the name of his zine. And he was arrested and fined. I don't know if he did jail time, but like one of the few artists jailed for doing art. And yeah, it's not pretty, but because it was uh, the comic book art form, you know, he he was punished for it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, this is even after the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund represented him. They lost. Oh. You know, um, so there's always danger of backlash, but it's usually on the more subversive, mm -hmm. underground side of things. Well, and I will. So, Fans Books Week is next week. Yay! These mm -hmm. these are all books 
that have been challenged. These, these three are manga. This one is saga, which was mentioned earlier. So who, who banned saga in their right mind? Who so, banned and, saga? And to be clear, it's banned and challenged books. Mm -hmm. So oh, yeah, yeah. in a lot of cases, <laughs> so saga has nudity that shows up. And so there are mm -hmm. parents who have challenged it based on mm -hmm. that not being something they, they want their kids exposed to. They're nude aliens. Come on, people. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. <laughs> <laughs> right, and violence and so violence and sexuality and mm -hmm. magic are the, the mm -hmm. three most common themes that mm -hmm. lead to a book being challenged or banned mm -hmm. in a school district or a mm -hmm. jurisdiction. So just mm -hmm. saying there's still there's still some pushback, mm -hmm. but it's it's perhaps not at the society wide level, it's more at the school board, the city, the mm -hmm. Yeah. I was, was going to say, I'm going to rip off an old Hollywood Squares jo joke, which is like, was it uh, violence, sex, and magic? Aren't those, the, isn't that the, isn't that the Bill of Rights? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, does mm -hmm. anyone from the audience have anything they want to ask our panel? Uh, yeah, you're, you're oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. You're right. I mean, your book is focused on Hemingway and Powers. Uh, what about like other media? I'm thinking specifically of like Woody Allen's uh, Midnight in Paris. Paris. Yeah. yeah. Again, Hemingway shows up all over uh, media. Period. And in fact, there was a like a time traveling soap opera that had him as a recurring character. Um, <laughs> He just, uh, he, he was in a, and I, in fact, I put it in here, he was in an, an, in an animated movie, in a Spanish animated movie. Um, so, yeah, he, once you're on a stamp, and once you win the Nobel, and once you win the Pulitzer, and he was also famous at a time where, you know, he was in magazines, and he was, he was sort of like the last, the last megastar of that kind of media. So it's it's you know it went like Hemingway, in sync, BTS. <laughs> that, that, that's what we have now. So Hemingway was the BTS of the 1920s. Everybody in the back row has no idea who that is. But, okay, no, no, my dad, my dad just said he knows who the Korean pop stars are. Okay, great. Well, you hear talking about the Korean pop stars. And I think the reason she did the comics back in that day is that was the woman suffering voting error. That's that was the, the way she wanted to put forth to help that woman suffering thing. I, I agree. Actually, I think that makes it, you know, 1920 mm -hmm. is the 19th Amendment, obviously through the teens, uh, women's right to vote mm -hmm. had been pushed. Uh, Native American women were able to get the right, right to vote in 1924. I think that that is true, and there and there is pushback too, of uh, you know her comics and the flapper era in general. There were, uh, I'm actually wondering if I can find it, but uh, oh here, so fashion uh, history is dominated by the flapper style, knee knee length hemlines, shift style garments and bobbed haircuts. Um, in Virginia, a legislative bill, uh, which failed to pass, attempted to prohibit women from wearing shirt waist or evening gowns which displayed more than three inches of her throat. <laughs> well, uh, Utah legislators worked to find women mm -hmm. whose skirts were higher than three inches mm -hmm. above the ankle. And in cities like Carmel, California, women couldn't wear heels taller than two inches without a permit from the city. <laughs> and, it, and I love this, in an attempt to sti uh, stifle tripping and falling related lawsuits. <laughs> um, you know, so there's pushback, mm -hmm. I mean, clearly at the time as they're seeing these uh, fashions become more generalized for the public, you know, there's always mm -hmm. somebody who's like upset that the norms of 15, 20 years mm -hmm. before are being, and it, like I said, and then in the 30s, we go back again. You know, it falls back to some of that pushback gets stronger and more heard, and mm -hmm. by the 40s and 50s, again, mm -hmm. it's being pushed back. So mm -hmm. I, I just wonder what our kids will find offensive. <laughs> you know, like what what will be left? You know, like like what what will like you know? Conservatism. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's like, can you believe they ate meat and pets didn't have the right to vote? You know, like it's gonna be something. It's gonna be something that we don't even consider that that will go in a direction. Um, anyway, there's a whole book about this called What If We're Wrong. Uh, it's really, really great. Chuck Klosterman. So, this was touched on briefly at the beginning on um, about trauma in graphic novels, especially like historical trauma or like memoir and trauma. Mm -hmm. 
on, and our two gentlemen was brought up, and um, another book he did was The Shadow, mm-hmm. The Shadow of No Power, mm-hmm. and it was his experience of 9-11 mm-hmm. in New York City, and I think that's one of my favorites. Um, and I was first introduced into graphic novels through Persepolis, but I also think it touches on trauma and historical narrative. Mm-hmm. Why do you think graphic novels are so good at explaining mm-hmm. not only personal trauma, but mm-hmm. historical narrative trauma? Yeah. That's such a great question. Um, she had a good teacher. <laughs> I almost sat in the shadow of no towers, but it was so big. And, and <laughs> but it is a really beautiful book. Um, I think that one thing that graphic novels can do um, that maybe a straight textual narrative can't, and even a film right, or radio, is that the graphic novel allows the space to pause and to move back and forth especially if you have the hard copy right in the text itself. And I think that allows for a much more complex reading, which can explain things like historical trauma in very complicated ways that can be digestible. Um, and I think Mouse does that really well, Persepolis, the books by Joe Seiko. And what's unique about the graphic novel is, I think this is actually what you mentioned before, is you don't always know whether or not to look at the image or the text. And sometimes that kind of cognitive dissonance can be very uncomfortable, which means that perhaps that creates empathy, right, an understanding for a particular moment that the author is trying to portray. Um, And whether or not you can articulate what that is, there's something that you feel that I think can add to a more complex emotional response, even than a film, which images are moving so quickly, right, or a book you can read, but you don't get the images. So I think it's a really special an important way to articulate historical trauma. Yeah. It, it's also the only medium where you get something that is first person and third person at the same mm-hmm. time. So you get them mm-hmm. saying something, but you see it happening mm-hmm. to them. Mm-hmm. There's a great comic series called mm-hmm. Barefoot Yen, and it's about, um, uh, it's told from the boy's perspective, and it's a memoir about the bomb mm-hmm. dropping in Hiroshima. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's mm-hmm. a series of, um, so it doesn't happen just in the one book. Over, mm-hmm. I think there's, there's a lot of them. Mm-hmm. It's like I've only read the first couple of them, but it's also really good at mm-hmm. explaining like the first person and third person. Yeah. You understand it from the boy's point of view, mm-hmm. but knowing what actually happened, you also understand it in this water. I was going to say, th- this is a heavy conversation about historical stuff. Comics are also still about grown men in pajamas punching one another. <laughs> it's, it's still, it is still fun. I just want to let you know. Comics are fun. This oh, okay. is true. This yeah. is true. I know. I, I chose the most depressing ones. But there are really fun ones, too. Yeah. Um, I, um, I don't read comics as much, but I was introduced to the comic, and I saw that you put it over there, um, called Bitch Planet. And it's a feminist... <laughs> kind of retelling of kind of exploitation comics from the 1970s, and I have to say, it is fun. It is really, really joyful, and profane, you're going to... Profane. Super, very profane. Super profane. Fairly violent, but also kind of turns the narrative upside down. So yes, comics can also be very, very fun, too. Does anyone have a recommendation for a fun comic? Before we... And you can buy Daniel Klaus, but he did Ghost World. Um, I love Eight Ball. I have first edition copies of Eight Ball, which I'm really excited. Mm-hmm. Um, I think his stuff is really great because it's weird and it's <laughs> out there. Um, another comic that actually has no words in it and it's just pictures is called Here. Um, it's by Robert McGuire, and it shows like a house and a plot of land over time. So they would be juxtaposed over a picture of the land of like 1750 mm. to the 1960s. So you'd see it in the same frame. So two pages are one frame. Yeah. Cool. So that that book is a particular um, influence on Chris Ware. Uh, in fact, if you look in this book, he does two posters after here. Oh. Okay. Uh, and it's Oak Park, which is where I live, and it's where Hemingway used to live. And it's that conceit. Here's what it looks like now but each bubble is a little bubble to a different time. So it's a great book. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, anything else from the audience? Uh, I, okay. I had a sort of question comment. Uh, I find it interesting, as I'm thinking about this, that we have a medium in the 1920s that was inhabited by a woman using it sarcastically and satirically to advance certain political conditions, we have a set of uh, 
graphic novels that are often used by people who, who are members of minoritized communities or who are trying to give stories out that aren't normally told. Uh, the comics, of course, are overlap with like with zine creation, going back to the 10th, 3rd, and science, mm-hmm. science fiction communities and fanzines. Uh, and we have a graphic novel about you know, Hemingway who embodied sort of the worst excesses of misogyny. <laughs> <laughs> and so in the spectrum we have, you know, all voices being heard here. And it's, if, if, if comics and images have been used as a vehicle to magnify the voices of those who have been disempowered or dispossessed, you know, is there, is there now no more entering where people who have had power historically are taking advantage of these hmm. spaces hmm. that previously were used by people who don't have academic credentials, for example, but hmm. can still write a graphic novel that gets at history, gets at experiences? Hmm. But I, so years ago, I, I was primarily a journalist, but I had Neil Gaiman, who's since become very famous. He just said, "There's nothing more punk rock than comic books because all you need is pen and paper." Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah it's, it, it is. It is the cheapest, you know. And he actually used to do these things called 24-hour comics, where he would just stay up and write 24 pages and illustrate 24 pages and mm-hmm. put them out. So uh, I think that under answers your question. But mm-hmm. there is no. You don't need any credentials. You can just do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, comics are part of the '90s feminist scene for sure. Rebel Girls, you know, that was zine making was a way to articulate all kinds of political activism, and yeah, used by can be created by anybody. Mm-hmm. One one thing I think is interesting about uh, Ethel Hayes too is the comic was named Ethel. So mm-hmm. it's like she, she gave herself already mm-hmm. a platform at that mm-hmm. point. Mm-hmm. Uh, so when she created Flapper Fanny, Ethel Hayes was already known because of the association. Um, but one thing I, I found interesting about her is uh, not only like the voice that she has in the cartoons, but because of her association with Ethel, and then of course with Flapper Fanny, she was given a platform to speak on issues. Mm-hmm. You know, usually like, uh, I think I have one from uh, Independent Women in 1927. And you you can almost see her sense of humor that would come through the comics when she said, uh, she said, the reason why so many marriages are failures is because so many failures are married. (laughs) (laughs) She said, not long ago, few women would have dared, not so long ago, few would women have dared to marry an idler, a drinker, or a waster to reform him. She was completely at his mercy. Now it's different. A girl takes her place in the economic world, and the chances that her mother or grandmother would never have dared to take. Her independence mm-hmm. makes it necessary to be sure of the man she now marries. Mm-hmm. I mean, she's that's a pretty bold statement, mm-hmm. but she's using her her status, you know, through the larger society to come out and kind of highlight again what mm-hmm. she's trying to get convey in like a one panel thing too, which I think is really cool. So you could be subversive. <laughs> yeah, that's right. yeah, a, le- a less alcoholic visual dork. Yes, right. Right. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely, yes. So. Yeah. Well, there's nothing else from the audience. I Do you guys have parting comments before we wrap up? Um, there is a contradiction in Ethel Hayes' story that I find fascinating is that, uh, you know, a lot of times while she was being portrayed, in the press because she had some celebrity status. It was always pictures of her drawing with her two kids next to her. Mm-hmm. Like she still had to run that balancing mm-hmm. act of yeah. being the good, mm-hmm. and he would, would even say, you know, her. they called her studio the playroom. And they had a picture mm-hmm. of her at her drawing table with oh. her kids there. So yeah. even though she was pushing, <laughs> pushing the boundaries, she at the same time had to kind of, you know, play off that, uh, you know, so she was holding on to that tether over here mm-hmm. while she was drawing with the other hand, it seemed, you know. Mm-hmm. And then um, after she got married and, uh, you know, the comic stuff, kind of what she was portraying started falling off in the 30s. Most of you probably know her work, but it's probably from the late 30s and 40s, which is Townhouse, mm-hmm. Town Mouse, Humpty Dumpty, mm-hmm. Little Red Riding Hood, all of those books. Mm-hmm. So she almost becomes as famous, if not more famous, for these kind of illustrated, the night, uh, I always want to say the nightmare before Christmas. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> what is that movie? No, that was, was right. that, that's a good one. No, no, that's the better movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so she really becomes more famous as a children's illustrator, you know, than her stuff from the 20s, oddly. So kind of falling back into those normal expectations, maybe. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I guess I don't really have you know, a big wrap-up final comment, except um, I would like to thank Julie and the House of Books for organizing it and, you know, reading and buying books from independent bookstores is super important um, and make great gifts. Uh, and uh, graphic novels, I think there's so many written about different time periods and eras in history, so if, if, you, if you haven't read a graphic novel, that can be a great entry point into it. They're not all super depressing, mm -hmm. um, but I think that you'll find that they're very, they're very, very fulfilling to read um, once, you, once you get started. So thank you very much. I can yeah. can yeah. I add something also? Um, the Western Heritage Center, we love these stories, you know, <laughs> and um, so we usually create traveling exhibits. So we now have a traveling display of mm -hmm. Hazel Hunkins, uh, who's a 1908 Billings grad who was the, the, at the forefront of the suffrage movement. Mm -hmm. But we also have a traveling pop-up exhibit with about 14 panels of Ethel Hayes, too. So with nice big photo il illustrations of her work and stuff like that, I don't even remember where it is right now. It might be at the airport. <laughs> uh, but if, if you know a, a place or a venue that mm -hmm. might want to host the exhibit, it's very easy to pick it up, pop up 12 panels, put it up for a couple of weeks somewhere secure. You could come here at some point if you wanted. Yeah. So at the Maybe college. Maybe at the library at the college. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so we do have those yeah. for loan too. So thank you. And, and also, so uh, I am on the end of a book tour. So um, uh, anyone who wants to, and I would love all of you to, please come and sign. This is my author copy. And so please come sign my book. Uh, I'm also signing copies of this book, so you, one, you can do one without the other. But uh, uh, I'll also be signing books, uh, and Christmas is around the corner. Come on, people. Or Halloween. We all know how it's hard to find that Halloween gift. Well, and we do have uh, copies of some of Robert's other books. They're over on the central display there. And if you would like a reading list, we have a list of books that Jen has recommended, of graphic novels that Jen has recommended, and you could jot down the ones that Ellen has mentioned as well, some of which sound mm -hmm. like we should probably have them on the shelves. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do have some Ethel Hayes as well, so including The Nightmare of the Fourth of yeah. <laughs> I think that's it, right? <laughs> uh, which is a brand new edition, by the way, that has um, some ornaments in it as well as that version. It's, it's her original illustrations, but this version with the ornaments just came out this month. Oh, cool. so. I was just going to plug his book, Mixtape of My Life. If it's there, it is. buy that. <laughs> <laughs> I illustrated that, so oh. I will also yeah. have that. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's true. Uh, uh, and watch uh, Billy Parrott's uh, was well, it's, well, it's not a live stream. It's coffee it's chat. yeah, coffee chat uh, where I talk about uh, Rob doing the greatest riff on nights in white satin. <laughs> so check that out on Facebook, people. All right, great. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you to our um, Rob's movies you never wanted to see. <laughs> 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 to me. Uh, it's like, yeah, this is a. Uh, well, so you can get a double signature on that. Yeah, <laughs> yes. You better wrap this up before everyone talks. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else have a book that they want? That they have yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you all for coming. Uh, and with that, we will sell some books. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.